Greetings live from the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas, and welcome to Engage at the Bush Center, presented by Highland Capital Management. I'm Freddie Ford, President Bush's Chief of Staff, and a former White House staffer who, after 12 years, has still refused to move on. This is the time of year when we'd normally be hosting you here at the Bush Center for festive holiday parties, so thanks instead for joining us virtually. Tonight's event is titled One Time in the Motorcade, and it's my biggest live audience ever. This was originally conceived in concert with our special exhibit, Liberty and Laughter, the lighter side of the White House. We opened it up with a splash on March 3rd and then promptly closed it two weeks later. Even without the exhibit, we decided to proceed with tonight's conversation because after a decidedly unfunny year, we hope to end our 2020 engaged season with a bit of laughter. To set the tone, let's get started with a video clip from the 2006 White House Correspondents' Dinner. You can see how much President Bush loves to laugh, usually at his own expense. Members of the White House Correspondents Association, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here I am. Here I am at another one of these dang press dinners. Could be home asleep. Little Barney curled up at my feet. But no. I gotta pretend I like being here. <laughs> the media really ticks me off. The way they try to embarrass me by not editing what I say. That was the late Steve Bridges, President Bush's favorite impersonator of him. So tonight we're going to be joined by six guests, uh, four are former Bush White House staffers, one is from President Obama's White House, and one is from President Clinton's White House. And they all have one thing in common, which is a love of laughter and the understanding of how important that laughter is to deal with the inherent stresses of working at the White House. Um, so I thought we'd begin tonight with Blake Gottesman. Blake was President Bush's personal aide at the White House. And then uh, after earning his Harvard MBA, came back to the White House as Deputy Chief of Staff where he oversaw the transition. He's now a partner at Berkshire Partners and he was kind enough to travel here tonight from Boston. Blake, it's great to see you. You've never looked better. So Blake, um, this is a pretty good likeness of you. Why don't you tell us what kind of vanity it takes for a person to have a bust made of oneself? Yeah, that's a lot of self-absorption, Freddie. Uh, well, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, what, uh, what a great event and opportunity, as you said, to, to try to bring, a lot, uh, bring about a little cheer at the end of a, of a tough year. Um, the, the, the bust is a, is a pretty silly story, as most of my stories uh, seem to be, but uh, th this one started, I think, in 2006. I had been... Uh, working for President Bush for seven years, and I had decided finally to uh, hang up my cleats and that I'd be heading off. And uh, I'm not one for big emotional goodbyes, and I and I knew that'd be the only kind I could have with the president in, in person. So, uh, so I set my departure date. Uh, I set it for the day after uh, we were coming back uh, from Iraq on a secret trip, and. Uh, and we came back and landed on the South Lawn uh, uh, of the White House. And, and uh, I remember middle of the night, and the president turns to me and he says, Minnie, uh, is one of, the, uh, one of the many nicknames. Uh, with Say that Minnie again, Minnie. Minnie, I'm, I'm going to see you tomorrow, right? Minnie, that's right. <laughs> and uh, he said, Minnie, I'm going to see you tomorrow, right? And I said, oh, yes, sir. And, uh, and I'd, I'd say I didn't typically make it a practice to lie to the leader of the free world, but, uh, but this was a case where... You know, it's kind of a technicality. I was going to see him in the form of the bust. And uh, so anyway, so I went back to the Oval Office in the middle of the night, and, and President Bush had proudly displayed there a, 
a bust of Winston Churchill uh, on loan from the British government. And, uh, and I thought it'd be a good idea to swap it out with a, a bust I had had made of myself uh, 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 in paper mache. And uh, so I, di I did that and, and, and headed off. And uh, anyway, the uh, <laughs> president showed up the next morning and uh, as you can see in the photo there, figured it out. <laughs> I should point out that um, after all those years, it survived largely intact, except for the nose, which completely fell off. And after a nose job, I think actually it's a slight improvement. <laughs> yeah, <I> was, <laughs> thank you. Looks I, better than the real one, I'm sure. I have heard President Bush say, uh, Blake Gottesman kept the White House alive with laughter, which is, I think, a pretty high compliment. But why do you think President Bush thought laughter was so important? And why would that compliment matter so much? Uh, well, it is a big compliment. I don't know if, if I kept the uh, la uh, White House alive with my own laughter. That that part would be uh, would certainly be accurate. No, um, he means you made others laugh. You know, he's a yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, occasionally, Mo mostly at my expense, which I was happy to do, uh, and I had a great time. And as you know, he. Uh, you know, President Bush is a serious guy when it comes to serious tasks, and he has a serious job. Um, but he's a joyful guy, and uh, and even though he takes the job seriously, he never takes himself too seriously. And uh, so I saw that firsthand for a long time working with him, and uh, and I think he was really clever in uh, in the way that he uh, used humor. He, he did it very effectively. Um, you told me not to ask you about Secret Service code names. They all started with the T for the Bush family. President Bush, Trailblazer, Mrs. Bush, Tempo, and yours was Tailwind? Well, I won't say whether it was mine or not, uh, Freddie. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, but let's just say uh, someone had the, had the Secret Service code name Tailwind, and, and I think, uh, well, we'll have to wait till a, a program later at night to talk about the rest of the story. <laughs> do, you, do you want to talk any more about Pre President Bush was great about, uh, uh, he was great about, Using humor, I think, very effectively. He, you know, it's nervous uh, making when you first meet the president, and frankly, even even people that have uh, spent a lot of time with him, um, it's the nature of the role. And uh, and I thought he did a great job. He, he used humor very effectively to put people at ease and make them comfortable. He got better advice out of his advisors, I think, for it. Um, and he did a great job of disarming otherwise uh, tense or awkward moments, I think, uh, quite effectively. And, and so he did it with political adversaries and, and foreign leaders. And, uh, and he'd throw people off, too, because they were expecting, in many cases, all the pomp and circumstance and formality of the role. And, you know, everyone has their note cards and their briefing books. And there's all this tension built up before these big, important meetings. And, uh, and he had a great way of sort of piercing through that in a, in a way that introduced some levity and allowed real work to get done. So he, uh, he was masterful, I think, at, uh, at employee humor, not just because he's fun and very funny, uh, but, uh, but because it's quite effective. Uh, this will be a theme tonight. We've dug up a few photos, and I think you found a few as well. So why don't we just have a little slideshow, and you can tell us. I think a lot of these will require an explanation. So first photo. Happy to do it. Where are you here? Yeah, uh, that's in the in the president's uh, and, and Mrs. Bush's cabin on Air Force One. And uh, you know, one great way to be funny is to to catch people, uh, you know, when the, when they're loopy after uh, you know a fourteen hour flight and full of jet lag. So anyway, we had just landed in this photo in Singapore, and um, if I remember the story right, the chief of protocol had, had uh, come up to you know brief President and Mrs. Bush, explain how the arrival ceremony would go. And of course, these are all very well choreographed. And, uh, and he says, you know, Mr. President, the, the American ambassador will board the plane. And, uh, and as an aside, he speaks fluent uh, Chinese. He, he speaks fluent Mandarin. And, uh, and I just sort of jokingly said under my breath, well, I guess that makes two of us. <laughs> and I hear this, Peanut, you don't speak any other language. Come on. You know, the English is the only, and you barely speak English. <laughs> I said, I, I beg your pardon, sir. I, just because I don't speak it with you doesn't mean I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> and I said, well, you watch. When Frank Lavin walks up those stairs, you're not going to understand a single word that we say to each other. And uh, anyway, then I rattled off for about 30 seconds what was my first and only Mandarin I've ever spoken without ever having taken a lesson. And so anyway, I think that's what prompted this uh, 
this silly reaction. <laughs> That's great. This is your desk. Uh, that was my desk uh, that in the Oval. Uh, that one, I think, Freddie, we may need to say just uh, while you're at the library, please uh, ask the uh, the archives to keep that one classified for, for uh, let's say, till 2045 or so. You know, as a matter of fact. There, there were more, more than a handful of photos like that, I think. It, it, you just reminded me, your emails will become public uh, in a month, January 20th, <laughs> 2021. So we'll find out. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, yeah. helping me not sleep tonight. Yeah, great. <laughs> what else? What are you picking up here? So I had had a really bad stomach ache <laughs> that, no. Uh, th that is, uh, uh, oftentimes when the, when the president was extra focused on something or extra worried about something, one way to, uh, to uh, soften that was to, um, uh, make fun of it. So we, at some point, we were very nervous about maybe the rug had been new or something like that. And 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 Barney and Miss Beasley were uh, a, a high source of risk for the rug. Uh, and These were the uh, dogs. So anyway, I, I brought some. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, President and Mrs. Bush's dogs. And uh, anyway, so I brought some fake dog poop uh, just to alarm him that they had uh, defiled the rug in the Oval Office. And then, you know, as soon as as soon as he saw it, I sort of promptly reach down barehanded like I just <laughs> grab it all myself. Anyway. Fantastic. Very present. Th these are really, this is really highbrow stuff, yeah. as you can see. This tightly correlated with my age at the time, although I'm not sure my, my sense of humor has gotten much more sophisticated. So many people know there's a full medical suite on board Air Force One, a doctor, an operating room. And are you the beneficiary of yeah. the care here? Uh, well, in this case, as you know, the president uh, is quite a needler, uh, as he says. He likes to needle, and uh, he sort of takes whatever is making something the most awkward, you know, uh, intense, and he goes straight at it, you know, which is something that no one else will talk about. So if, if memory serves, I had a, you know, what most people have around this age, a blemish, or uh, what, we, what he might call a zitsky, <laughs> and... Uh, so I had a zit, and, I think, and uh, no one else would ever say anything about it. Never sure. mind your boss. Never mind the leader of the free world. But I think in President Bush's case, I, he must have brought it up every two to three minutes and asked everyone on the plane, whatever you do, don't mention it. Don't look at it. Don't talk about it. He doesn't want to talk about the zit. And so this was the level of attention that my... Uh, <laughs> My uh, blemish got on uh, on Air Force One. They finally brought out the paddles just to get rid of uh, to stop him from talking about that it. guy's like an Air Force general and a physician yeah. operating on your zit. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. White House physician emeritus. Yeah, good good use of his time. I know. Uh -huh. Anyway, that that's that gives you a sense of the needling uh, uh, that he was fond of. That's great. Well, um, I think we have one more photo. Not a photo. You asked yeah. for this, Blake, but yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, speaking of needling stories, uh, he went golfing. I was filling in as the aide at the time. I was sort of the understudy and was was doing the aide duty down in Crawford, Texas, where you've spent a lot of time, Freddie. And uh, and he was golfing at the time uh, in Waco, and he he you know reaches down to pick up a putt and his his pants split, I mean, just straight down the seam, you know, and, and he's the president of the United States. And so immediately he turns to me and I'm brand new to the job and I haven't done the aid thing very much and I'm nervous and I've got all the bags of stuff I think he might need, but he doesn't actually need. And, and he turns to me and says, Minnie, what size are you? Take them off. <laughs> and so he swaps pants with me, which is fine, you know. So he's, we're out on whatever hole we're on and we swap pants. And I thought, you know, he's not going to say anything about it. I mean, I, I just gave him my pants. You know, the guy's got a, a whole set of pants just because of me. He's not going to say a word. And I think the entire rest of that, that outing, he would ask everybody to take a look at my pants, my <laughs> pants, and, uh, and ask why they were split. And, uh, and he kept asking, why do you have a bag on? Why are you trying to cover up your pants? What happened back there? So uh, anyway, but, but it, it, as a tribute to the president's good sense of humor and good nature, he... Uh, just this spring, uh, when Tom Brady split his pants in a tournament, uh, I got a short email from the president that said, uh, it happens to some fine folks. <laughs> <laughs> so.
stuff. G gives you a good sense of his nature. Tom needed a Blake. Well, Blake, you're a prince of a man to take the time to talk to us. Thanks for these great stories. It's good to see you, and happy holidays. Thanks. Likewise, Freddie. Delighted to do it. So we're going to follow Blake up with a, a conversation we recorded last week with one of Blake's predecessors named Israel Hernandez. Israel was also a personal aide to President Bush, and um, he served, I think, even before President Bush was governor. This is back for when George W. Bush was running for governor. And then he went on to serve in the White House in some senior positions as well as in the Commerce Department. He's currently head of corporate affairs with SoftBank, and we spoke to him last week. Here's our conversation. Israel Hernandez, it's great to see you. How are you? Freddie, it's good to see you. How are you? I'm well, thank you very much. I'm wonderful. Your backdrop looks a lot more appealing than mine, although it looks fake. It is. It's San Francisco. I lived there for about nine years after the administration. Um, well, you were uh, personal aide to President Bush before he was president, before he was even governor, and so it'll be fun to uh, hear some of those stories with you. As you know, the name of tonight's event is One Time in Motorcade. Um, and I think you have a story about one time not in a motorcade. This was a moment when he was running for president. He was governor of Texas and was at this point campaigning across the country, going to different states. And this is a moment where he had also introduced the initiative of No Child Left Behind. Um, so we had, for this particular event, we were in Los Angeles and Mrs. Bush was along part of the tour as well. So Mrs. Bush had done a few events. The president was in the gymnasium making the announcement about the end of the period, which at that point had been the largest amount raised for any campaign. And as we were headed to the motorcade, Mrs. Bush uh, said, oh, I, I think there was a gift that they gave me that I left behind and I can't seem to find it. I think I left it. Would you help me and go and grab the gift? And I said, absolutely, not a problem. I, 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 know, I know which rooms you were in, I'll, I'll go look for it. When I came back from getting the gift, the motorcade had left. And if you can imagine, <laughs> I was completely apoplectic thinking, how am I gonna get back to this airport in Los Angeles? <laughs> Luckily for me, there was a cop who was still there who was part of this whole day event. And I said, I just ran up to him and I said, listen, I am part of this motorcade. I'm part of this group. I, I went to get something. I got left behind. Can you please help me? I need to get to the airport. I need to hurry. Somehow we need to catch up to them. He's like, well, I don't know if I can catch up to them, but we will definitely give it a try. So he was really nice. I couldn't tell if we were going to catch up to the motorcade. He went the back way through LAX. We see the plane. I know it's still there. <laughs> they have the stairs, but I also noticed that they're kind of moving the stairs back. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. He turns his siren on. He gets the attention of the plane. They put the stair back in. They open the door. I'm running out of this car. I'm trying to go up the stairs. And the president is like, Izzy, don't worry. No child is going to be left behind. We won't leave without you. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to the next event, but we're not going to go without you. It was one of these moments where he uses humor in the most, most disarming ways because it kind of signals to you, listen, you know, it's going to be okay. It's not a problem. We can, you know, this will all work out fine. He always finds a way to make you comfortable. He actually still to this day tells a story of a time earlier when you were in fact left behind. Still, he still tells the story. Well, it's because it happened so early in the, this whole campaign. And there was a moment where I was left behind. <laughs> so this was before even running for president. This is when he was running for governor. The campaign was headquartered in Austin. Um, but the president was still managing general part of the Texas Rangers. And he was campaigning, going to different cities all over the state. But so I lived in Dallas because he lived there. The family lived there. The girls were going to school there. And so I would always drive to his house really early and make sure that, you know, we would leave on time. This particular moment, and for those that live in Dallas or know Dallas or have driven in Dallas, I had to drive through the Central Expressway. And on this one moment, this one morning, it was raining. And there was an accident which really halted traffic. And because of the accident, 
I was stuck in traffic and I couldn't get out. So I was, I didn't know what to do. I pretty much just broke the law. Sure. Which, I shouldn't be saying this, but I did. I kind of got on the, on the side and just drove to the nearest exit and got out, drove to his house. And Mrs. Bush is at the door saying, you're too late. He thought, <laughs> My he waited. He, I can't believe he waited. He waited for you, but you're, it's, he's, he doesn't want to be late. So he's uh. left. And I thought, oh, my gosh, he's gone. What am I going to do? So I literally just ran back to the car. I hurried. I rushed. I rushed as fast as I could. And I got to the hotel where he was speaking. It was a big lunch uh, morning event, rather. And um, I, I saw the car. I, I parked right next to it. I saw him getting out of the car. So I was like, oh, I think I'm going to make it. So I drive right up and park right next to him. And I was, I was just about to say, sir, I'm sorry. He's like, ah, he's like, too late. You're late. <laughs> Don't let it happen again. And I said, no, I won't. He goes, you're, yeah, you're right. It won't because we won't accept another late tardy event like this. <laughs> That's agonizing. I like picturing him. For me, it's very hard to picture him driving himself. So this would have been when he drove, I think, a Lincoln town car. Is that right? That thing was enormous. A great mental image. It is enormous. And uh, yeah, he. I think he always, you know, that was not the only one he had. I think he had one part of that. Uh, one of President Bush's, I think, nephews, uh, Walker Stapleton, tells a story of, of when George W. Bush would drive that Lincoln. He had a maneuver called, I think it was called the Four Lane Johnny. And he'd be on the big car phone taking notes and he cut over four lanes and he he coined that the four lane johnny i think that is a uh a tribute or not to midland i mean when yeah. i think back of all of, of the stories that i hear and from his friends they nickname everything in midland and you were not israel but izzy right yeah so i got that name izzy from the president when he was going to announce that he was running for governor. So we flew from, from Dallas to Houston, and we were met at the airport by President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush. And as he introduced me as his aide to his parents, he said, this is Israel, but he goes by Izzy. And <laughs> right, that then, moment. <laughs> right then in that moment, he, he, he nicknamed me Izzy, and it's, it's yes. now probably going to be in my birth in my death certificate when sure. I die. Uh, so that the personal aid often has some very personal uh, responsibilities. Some sometimes of the olfactory nature. This is when he was running for governor, and we were campaigning. And this was at this moment. This was a day where we were not only campaigning, but we were doing fundraising events. And we were in East Texas with the Lilly family. And the Lilly family was a big supporting family of then candidate George W. Bush. But we had uh, an event in their house at a hog and pig farm. And this was also in the middle of the summer, by the way. So you can imagine being in a hog and pig farm. Not in, hog heaven. It is not hog heaven. And we were there during the day campaigning and and on a hot, sunny day. And, you know, the president will sweat. I mean, just like everybody else in a moment like that. But we were already dressed for the day. And we were then going on to New Orleans to do a fundraiser that evening, right after being in Nacogdoches. So we get to New Orleans and we're greeted by the, 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 the couple that's going to help and support the president. We're doing a fundraising event. And she comes up to me and says, I don't know how to tell you this, but you smell like pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and she said, is there any way we can fix this before the event? So she, kind of, she comes back with her husband's cologne. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm not sure you know the president that, I mean, then, the candidate, then. I said, George Bush and Cologne just do not go. Mm -hmm. It's like the worst thing I can even imagine. But she said, oh, no, you have to you have to do something. We have to kind of hide this smell. So I went up, I went up to him and I said, sir, 
Um, the host is host is here is very worried because you smell like a pig. And <laughs> need to find a way to hide this smell. She's offered her husband's cologne, <laughs> or you could take a bath or shower rather, and then I could air out your blazer. And he looked at me and he said, "Izzy." You put on the cologne. I'm not going to put on the cologne. I'm going to take a shower. So we actually showered and we did as much as we could. But then he used it because at the beginning of the reception, sure. he stood up and he said, if, you, if, you are, if you're if you smelling something funny, you're smelling something weird like a pig, well, that's me. And kind of use that as a kind of breaking humor to get this conversation started. Well, Izzy, it's so fun to talk with you, especially to hear these stories from uh, from the earlier days. Uh, 43 sends his best to you, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks for doing this. I think these just remembering these events are, are great for memory, and uh, yeah, these are great to do. Thanks. It's great to see you, Freddie, and my best wishes to everyone, including President and Mrs. Bush. All right, thanks again to Israel for joining us last week. Last week, I also had the good fortune to catch up with a friend of mine, Charity Wallace, who worked for Mrs. Bush at the White House and then came down to Dallas with her and served as her chief of staff and then here at the Bush Center. Uh, she joined us last week from Washington, D.C., where she currently serves as a senior vice president and managing director uh, for global women's issue at the International Development Finance Corporation. Here's the video of our conversation. Charity Wallace, great to see you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Of course, great to see you. Sad we're not there in person. Yeah. Well, we insisted that you were a part of this program because I think you have the best laugh. And whenever I think of Charity, I just think of, of laughter. And one thing we thought it would be fun to hear from you about is Mrs. Bush, who people don't realize has a pretty um, wicked sense of humor. And uh, I wonder if you have any stories that reflect that? Well, there's so many stories to be told, but um, when I was thinking about some of the funnier things, I was taught, I was thinking about her book tour, actually, in 2010 for Spoken from the Heart, and this know, is we when traveled, you were her I was her chief of staff. staff, yes, and we traveled to 30 cities in 30 days, which was quite incredible, <laughs> um, most of which was on commercial travel, so that was also a very interesting experience, but we did go to Chicago to tape the Oprah show and Jenna and Barbara came with Mrs. Bush and we actually had a smaller plane. We had a chartered plane for that. And as we were approaching Chicago, it got kind of super bumpy. Um, and so everyone was strapping in and, and Jenna um, said, mom, I'm like, you know, obviously concerned because uh, it was, didn't feel very comfortable. And Mrs. Bush just looked over at her, you know, from her magazine, looking through her magazine and said, well, Jenna, when your number's up, your number's up. <laughs> <laughs> and then so Jenna cool. was like, Mom, you've had a lot more numbers. Like, well, <laughs> I worry about you on that trip because I've been on a plane <laughs> that was bumpy with you. And I remember you, no offense, but turning a shade of green that I didn't think humans could reach. How did you, how'd you manage on that one? That one, yeah, that was interesting. That was the 10th anniversary of September 11th. And I was facing backwards. Um, if you'll remember, I was facing Mrs. Bush. And um, at one point, it was super bumpy. And we couldn't, we kept trying to land and couldn't. And the president was quipping about some things on that. And, uh, and then you and I switched seats because I... Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. But the thing President Bush said was like, Charity, don't barf on me. This is my only suit. <laughs> <laughs> We just need to get on the ground. Holy so you mentioned commercial travel. That was probably like a splash of cold water. Especially the first one was a splash of cold water. Not for Mrs. Bush, but for the, the team that was with her. So we, uh, Mrs. Bush, did an event in Houston. It was her very first event after coming back from Washington, D.C., and so we flew Southwest and, you know, of course she got to pull up to the bottom of the plane and sit there while all the people boarded, but they weren't going to hold seats. So they had, so I went on the plane to hold the first row. The secret service is behind me holding the second row. And, um, all these people are passing, giving us like this, 
the stink eye because, you know, of course in Southwest, you just like want to get as close to the front as possible and kind of saying snide things. And I'm, you know, trying to be kind, but I'm like, just keep moving. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, Mrs. Fish came on. She was the very last aboard, of course. And then everyone just started cheering and oh, nice. I burst out into tears because it was such a <laughs> breath of fresh air to be in Texas where they're loved. And, um, and then of course, you know, after, as we, then we were the first to get off the plane and got to go down the stairs and onto the tarmac and in the, in the car. And she turned and said, well, that was just so much fun. I love Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> I have been on one commercial flight with president Bush <laughs> and our main job was to stop people who wanted to take pictures of him while he was asleep. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Give him a few minutes. <laughs> exactly. Um, you and I got to go to Africa a few times for reasons that people might not expect a former president and first lady to do, which was to renovate these old health clinics. That's right. And we worked. I mean, I hauled lumber and bricks and you did, what did you do? I did intricate painting with Mrs. Bud. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys did the big, huge, heavy lift and um, Mrs. Bush, as we all know, is very meticulous and really detailed. And so when we were painting, we there was rebar on each of the windows. Um, and so, and we wanted to make sure everything looked beautiful. So Mrs. Bush assigned um, me and her to all of the, the very detailed painting um, for the week that we were at the clinic. <laughs> We finally finished it. That was actually a really huge site. And there was a group of a huge line of women lined up to come in. And, and you know, people are nervous, obviously, because they're nervous about the test itself. It's not super comfortable. Um, and then also just obviously the results. Um, and so the president was so great about wanting the women to feel, you know, comfortable. And so he invited them all in and they all sat. And then they were playing music and they were singing. And, and of course, you know, he wanted to um, make sure that they felt his support. So he jumped up and started wildly dancing. And we all know what a great dancer the president is. Um, we agree. But, um, and so Mrs. Bush said, Terry, let's go in the back. Let's go in the back and watch, watch Bushy dance and, and laugh at him. <laughs> so there's like video. It got on video. I mean, because it was literally hysterical. And he was, I mean, it's the, the great part is it's just such a, a testament to both of their um, hearts for um, women all over the world, but also just the fun nature of, of both of them and their, their relationship and just how fun they are together. Well, people have probably asked you this. They say, well, is, is politics, is working in politics, which of course we don't work in anymore, but is working in politics more uh, like the show House of Cards? I said, well, often it's really more like the show Veep. This is so and true. You have a scene in Ohio that I feel like is straight out of a, an episode. It could have been an episode of Veep. Um, so Mrs. Bush was going to a ceremony for the Underground Railroad in Ohio. And I had just started as her director of advance at the White House. Um, it was in 2004. So she's and first lady at the time. She was, a, she was the first lady at this time. She arrives in Ohio. Um, and it had been, like I said, somewhat of a challenging trip. Um, they were running about an hour and a half or two hours behind schedule, which is always good, <laughs> too, especially with the pushes. Um, so, you know, she sat around for a very long time and finally they said, okay, we're ready to go. And so I briefed her on kind of what was going to happen. We're going to go out to the stage. She's going to go um, to her seat. Then they're going to introduce her at some point. She'll deliver prepared remarks. And then there will, then she'll go back to her seat. The video, will, there's going to be a video that will start so that everything will go dark. And that was her cue to leave. And it was all being televised. So it was live. So as we walk out, as I'm leading her out to the stage, um, a, it was <laughs> a group of nearly naked dancers passed right in front of us. And then um, somebody was like pushing a cart of, the, of their clothes behind them, which probably would have been a good thing. Long order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that happened. <laughs> then she finally got to stage. So I like, went over the order again. She goes out. And there were Tibetan monks that were seated on stage right behind her. There was like a whole group of people. Um, and so she started delivering her remarks. She 
she delivered her remarks. It was kind of an a interesting experience. And then um, she went back to her seat and everything went dark. So I was waiting for her to leave because we had to get we had to get to a plane and waiting for her to leave and realize that she um, was not planning to leave. And so I <laughs> um, crawled onto the stage <laughs> in my skirt suit and um, was and crawled behind one of the Tibetan monks and tapped <laughs> him on the shoulder and was like, can you please tap the first lady of the United States? And so then he tapped her. She turned around and I was like, we have to go. And so she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so then I crawled off stage and she, you know, of course, very graciously stood and, and walked off stage. And then we went to the motorcade, but um, it was a very unique experience. I had, I also crawled in a ball gown during the Kennedy Center honors oh. <laughs> into the presidential box um, to tell Diane, uh, Diane Sawyer that she was needed or something. It was totally bizarre. The second time I met Diane Sawyer, uh, she was interviewing President Bush, and I said, you know, uh, we met in a bathroom stall about a year ago. <laughs> she looked at me like I had six heads, and my dad had built a building in Louisville, Kentucky, named for her like grandfather, and I was sweeping it. I was on, <laughs> helping my dad out with this construction project. I was sweeping it, and she came in. That really took her aback. Oh, my God. I love it. I wasn't crawling. I Charity, <laughs> it's always such a delight to talk with you. Thank you for taking the time. Of course. Thank you. Thanks for letting me join tonight. Charity, if you're watching, thanks again for talking with us. That was fun. Uh, next up is a live guest, a friend of mine named Bobby Schmuck, who was the deputy political director for President Obama. And in that role, he traveled uh, all over the world with President Obama. Bobby is now a uh, managing partner with Guggenheim Partners, and you're in Los Angeles tonight, Bobby. How are you? Yes, sir. Welcome to my living room, Freddie. It's good to be with you. How are you? Uh, great. It's good to see you, pal. You're nice to light the fire. Nice and toasty in here. It gets a little cool at California at night, so we like to set the tune. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the President's Club and, you know, the former presidents hang out together and... Uh, you know, sit around the fire together, for example. And I said, there's a little truth to that, but it's really the staffs, I think, who have the bond. And, and um, one of the best parts about my job was getting to become friends with you um, in our little f former President's Club staff club. But uh, before we start, Bobby. Yeah, how about that? Uh, yeah. Um, I thought we might show a clip uh of President Obama being funny, and then you can talk to us about it. Fire away. It's been four years since I was last at the Al Smith Den. And I have to admit, some things have changed since then. I've heard some people say, uh, Barack, you're not as young as you used to be. Where's that golden smile? Where's that pep in your step? And I say, settle down, Joe. I'm trying to run a cabinet meeting here. <laughs> yeah, great comedic timing. Hey, had amazing timing. I mean, it, it's been hilarious to listen to um, some of your former staff uh, speak to the gregariousness and the openness that President Bush deployed humor. President Obama wasn't exactly the same way, but when he did, it was surgical, and the timing was uh, very precise and deployed in, um, in much the same spirit, which was to not take himself too seriously and to create a culture around us where uh, we kept in mind who we were working for and, and, uh, and to put other people first. Uh, the name of this program is One Time in the Motorcade, so as a result, we've ended up with uh, a, a huge proportion of uh, transit-related stories, and so uh, I think you have one to share with us about One Time in the Motorcade. <laughs> hey, at the time, I wish I wouldn't have had it to share, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there is a photo. We could, we could toss it up first, I think, if you've got it, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there, yeah. This is, uh, so I, I served in political capacity for <laughs> President Obama, but Mrs. Obama didn't have her own political staff. Uh, so I, I would travel with her quite frequently, particularly in the period of time around the reelect in 2012. But we were in Florida on this particular trip, uh, I think at a military base for an official event. And uh, one of the trappings of the motorcade and moving with principals, uh, particularly White House motorcades, is that you're in 12 passenger vans. So you're sliding in, <laughs> sliding out. And, uh, <laughs> 
And it's like well, a rat I, race. Too, it wasn't the first time I'd done this, but it was the most. Yeah, you're, you're, you're sliding. You're in, you're out. I mean, it is, uh, it's constantly a game of catch up. And I, I, I just caught the seat of my pants on a, on a belt buckle or something that was hooked into the back seat and, and didn't realize it until we were proceeding down the back hallway, going to the back of house for the stage. And I just felt air rush up the back of my leg. And I, uh, I said to Tina Chen, depicted here uh, in, in the black suit, um, Tina, I think I've torn my, my pants. Would you mind taking a look and, and just let me know? And, Tina, for all of her leadership and intelligence, is not known for subtlety or for being quiet. So that was my own <laughs> mistake in asking her because the guffaws and the oh and the uh, the reaction was severe. I, I knew I was in trouble. And of course, we're back of house, and she's like, "Flotus, Flotus, Flotus, you have to see this." And I couldn't duck away fast enough. And luckily, my uh, great friend in that moment, Lawrence Jackson, the photographer, yeah. caught this moment, which was. Yeah, I'd split it pretty good, and uh, Mrs. Obama, not known at the time for her outrageous humor, uh, but a very funny person in her own right, said, um, you know, Bobby, we are here showcasing America, <laughs> and that's, that's not going to get fixed. And I said, yes, ma'am, I understand, and then she let out a pretty big laugh, and it was, um, I, I will tell you, Freddie, that rip didn't get better throughout the day, if you know what I mean, and uh, <laughs> the, the pants didn't survive. <laughs> And you couldn't ask to borrow her pants, unlike Blake. No, that you know that's the that's the secret. President, and First Lady have valets that yeah. uh, are active duty in the in the U.S. Navy. They have spare clothes. Uh, there was no valet uh, then or now for me, so I was I was on my own, and um, it was a drafty day from Florida back to D.C. <laughs> We've talked a lot tonight about how President Bush would use humor to make sure that those in his orbit were comfortable and that the culture was right. And I wondered if President Obama uh, was keyed in on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, as I said, is, is a, had a different emotional bandwidth in that he didn't lead with humor and it wasn't, uh, it sounds like your life and, and the lives of many people around you, you're walking through a landmine of humor. Um, I can't say that was the same, but, uh, you know, in this moment, as I see on the screen, you know, this was a, we called it a walking movement. This is walking back into the White House gate. If we were within a couple blocks of an event, President Obama would ask just to walk, uh, which required enormous <laughs> bandwidth protection from the Secret Service. And uh, something as simple as a two-block walk was not sure. as easy. But in this moment, um, the press pool, the protective press pool, the 13 or so members of uh, different news agencies who were with the president in every movement were rushing out of their vehicles anticipating a vehicle movement and now rushing to capture the president doing something as simple as walking with a cup of tea back to the White House. And the president here is just delighted by the fact that they are tripping, sprinting, running, <laughs> trying to catch the best shot. And he's saying to himself, guys, I'm just drinking tea. We're just going back to work. Uh, so <laughs> it, this was a particularly egregious example. At Marvin Nicholson, who's significantly taller than me, more handsome too, uh, is also laughing because Marvin knows it's part of our job to help set up so that they do get that shot. And the president, as you see, didn't break stride thinking it's probably okay that we just get back inside without <laughs> really making sure this moment lives in infamy. <laughs> well, did you But to your point, he, he, did, he did delight in these moments that kind of broke out of character uh, and, and would be the very human interactive points of, of, of both staff, Secret Service, military press, all kind of jumbled together, all moving in uh, coordinated chaos. Uh, at any one point in time. I just love how uh, both Presidents Bush and Obama would make sure to make sure that we could laugh and, and were comfortable. But I wonder if as a staffer, you also felt an obligation to, to provide the president, the one with the burdens, uh, some comic relief. Yeah, you know, we did. And I was blessed to be around people who were funny. Um, and, and President Obama certainly had a really good uh, receptive sense of humor. It's a tricky line because you know, you're aware of the gravity of the office. You're aware of the gravity of the work that you're doing. You're not always aware of what is going on for that president's job. Um, you know, case in point, military operations. Case in point, any number of different briefing materials they may be sifting through that has nothing to do with, incidentally, what you are doing. Uh, so you do have to deploy it carefully. But, um, you know, it, it is, it's a delight when it works out. And you do it trepidatiously and, and certainly... Uh, President Obama would delight in the humor between, you know, the cohort of people who were of a similar age, a uh, similar cohort, and, and, and would rip on each other for different reasons. Um, something that uh, 
and this is slightly out of order, but this is uh, this photo is election night in 2012, and it's significant for this reason. One, we won re-election. This is right after the election had been called, and Governor uh, Romney, Senator Romney, now uh, had made the call. But you'll notice my my good friend Joe Paulson, who is still President Obama's deputy chief of staff, and myself have have beards, much like I'm still trying to grow here, but. <laughs> After the first presidential debate in 2012, which had not gone as well for us as we had hoped it would, uh, a, a small cohort of junior staff who were traveling decided that we would start to grow out our facial hair and try to have what we called a rally beard or a victory beard. And for uh, those of us who were 28 and not particularly as manly as we had hoped, it was not as, um, not as functional as it may have been as, a, as an endeavor. But... Um, one of the things that we did, you know, and, and it caught on through the White House. A bunch of people were doing it. And so we would be back at house, and, and, you know, we were moving from speech to speech. It was 2012. The schedule was very busy. This is October. It's the last month. And President Obama kind of saunter up, and he'd hit a signing table backstage before we're going out, and he'd look at you, and he'd say, everything's set. Things are good. How many people? 8,500. Okay, good. And he said, you know, Bobby, as a general rule, uh, a beard is supposed to cover your whole face. <laughs> and what I'm seeing with you is a patchwork quilt. Some skin, some hair. And President Obama, known for his academic nature, couldn't even get through that without <laughs> some skin, some hair, you know, patchwork quilt. It was poetic even in its description, and it was a dagger yeah. to your heart. And he'd say, now you see with Marvin, Marvin is covering his whole face. And I would say, sir, Marvin is 44 years old. That's, that's a big difference. That's a lot more time. But, you know, the tricky thing, Freddie, is that I'm sure you deal with this, too, is uh, you can be the receiving end of the joke, but it's not always your role to defend yourself to the death. So <laughs> That's right. Uh, we had a good run with that. Uh, the beards went as far as they, as they did. You could see in the photo um, no one really succeeded. And it was nice because weeks into the almost, week, uh, almost daily ridicule from this, President Obama was just about to go on stage, and, uh, and he said, hey, Bobby, come here. He goes, you know, the beard thing, I can't grow one either. Just a caterpillar right here. Okay. And then he went right to stage and gave caterpillar? a speech to about 30,000 people. So just a caterpillar <laughs> was the phrase. <laughs> just a caterpillar. So I appreciated that. I appreciated the, uh, you know, the, the sort of humanness of that moment. Absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, it, you know, the beard thing was fun. And uh, obviously I, I look at it as a, as a huge propulsion for the reelection and uh, where we ended up. Um, you know. But it was uh, – Good bit of fun to have, and, and it was obviously anytime you can have your principal in that moment break the monotony of five cities a day, relatively same speech, um, and you know to the extent that you can provide some levity, some flow to the day. Uh, I, we always thought that that where appropriate, that was a good thing to deploy. Occasionally, you and I uh, got to witness the presidents use humor to help each other, or maybe poke fun at each other when our paths would cross in our travels, and in, in Africa, we got to see that up close. That's, I think you, yeah, basically, absolutely. I've given up. I'm about to fall over, and I've given up and let you take over. Yeah, these were your unstable years, yeah. um, <laughs> mostly physically as you were exiting vehicles. That's a heavy but, uh, No, this was an odd time. I mean, I was, um, this is in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, I had gone on the advance, so I broke away from my regular role to go for 10 or 12 day advance trip for what President Obama was doing in Tanzania. It was a four stop African tour. And, and as I recall, Freddie, it, it was actually, it just overlapped with a, a trip that you had there totally coincidentally doing some work for the Bush Institute. Um, and so this is the site of the US Embassy in Dar es Salaam. And what we had decided to do to commemorate a, a bombing that had taken place at the previous embassy about 15 years prior was to lay a wreath in remembrance of the Tanzanians and the Americans who died in that bombing. And we extended an invitation, I think, me to you, for, for President Bush to join that. You were, I think, enthusiastic about doing that. And, and as I recall, the embassy and the Tanzanian people were excited about that because there was a huge PEPFAR office at that embassy. And so um, there was enormous interest in having President Bush there as well. So in any case, that's the setup. We get there. Um, you know, I had met President Bush once very briefly before, but any time we were able to interact with other former presidents' offices, it really felt like you were feeling the arc of the office, it was the arc of history, really, in having those presidents interact. And um, it was always fun to see President Bush um, 
interact with President Obama, always fun to expect and, and not know where the humor would go, and it didn't disappoint. I mean, there were two things that happened on this trip. Do I have time to tell both of them, Freddie? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So I, I'm, I ended up briefing President Bush and President Obama on just the very basic movements for the wreath. You walk out, you pick up the wreath, you drop it, moment of silence, and they were supposed to make a movement back to their vehicles. Now, what I hadn't realized at the time was that we were running way ahead of schedule, and so we needed to hold. You, I think, had planned to leave immediately. So what I told Always. Presidents Obama and Bush was to, <laughs> exactly, was to drop the wreath, bow their heads, shake some hands, and to make an organic movement to the vehicles and depart. It, it wasn't my most precise use of language. What I meant was a natural movement back to the cars. But on organic movement, President Bush stopped me and he goes, I have a Harvard degree, but what the hell is an organic movement? <laughs> and, it, and an elbow to President Obama and a wink to me. And I, and I felt like I was on the inside. You know, it's like, OK, this is a run of the mill event. It's got some gravity to it because you do have uh, a moment where you're commemorating organic something. Organic movements and, do and, have gravity and President Bush is. They, they certainly do. <laughs> and I probably should have left the gravity ones in, in place of uh, using it for an actual presidential movement. But <laughs> none, nonetheless, they go and they lay the wreath. There were no organic movements to the cars because everyone's running ahead. President Obama came back. President Bush didn't leave because he walked back with President Obama. Um, and so now here we are back inside of one of the embassy buildings. President Bush, I think, had planned to greet with some Marines and some folks that we had already seen. And now you're here in a mismatch of Marines, two presidents, Secret Service details, staffs, controlled chaos, but everyone's meeting each other and having a good time. And President Bush decides, once he learns President Obama has about 20 minutes to wait, that he's on his way out as he was supposed to go in the first place. And so, Freddie, you, we said our goodbyes, and President Bush said sayonara and out the door back to his motorcade, which unbeknownst to us, because we had not left yet, was blocked. So the egress for the Bush presidential motorcade totally blocked by the Obama presidential motorcade, completely out of our domain. We're inside, we're waiting, we're holding until all of a sudden we hear, we saw someone coming back towards the door. It's an armed embassy door. Someone goes to open it, and then all of a sudden we see this bright light come in, and President Bush goes, how the hell am I supposed to get out of here? <laughs> Motorcade's blocked. And so, <laughs> so President Obama looks to us and he says, let's get his motorcade unblocked, as if we had anything to do with the motorcade. It worked out. Secret Service had their had their way with it. There was another egress, and it played out. But it was um, it was a great it was a great showcase of the fact that levity between two formers uh, or now two formers levity between a current and a former president, um, and and sort of an understanding of the the chaos of the role, um, the the parts you can manage, the parts you can't manage, uh, and and the bits in between where if you're not going to have a little fun with it, what's the point? Exactly. Well, this was a lot of fun, and you're kind to take the time. Give Betsy our best, and happy holidays, Bobby. Thank you. My great pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Freddie. Take care. Good to see you, pal. Uh, I was also fortunate last week to speak with Josh Bolton, who was White House Chief of Staff uh, for, I think, four years for President Bush. And um, so as Chief of Staff, he, he witnessed up close President Bush's strategic use of humor uh, as a tool, and, and, and Josh also deployed it himself, often in a dry and deadpan manner. Um, one hot summer, for example, he ran a 5K in a suit in Crawford, Texas. Earlier this year, I saw him give President Bush a book called Specimens of Hair and asked if President Bush wanted to contribute a chapter. Um, and, and so we checked in with a very funny man named Josh Bolton last week. He's the CEO of the Business Roundtable, but he took a few minutes to talk with us. Here's that conversation. Josh, thanks for taking the time to join us. We're, uh, we're talking about humor tonight at the end of a tough year. And uh, one way we thought we could uh, bring some joy to people during the season was to share stories from the White House as, as President Bush's chief of staff. Uh, during some dark days, you, um, you witnessed some light moments. We wanted to ask you to share some of those with us tonight. First, how did President Bush use humor as a tool when he was president? Freddie, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for thinking of me to on a, on a program on on humor. Uh, humor was really, really important in uh, the Bush 43 White House. Um, you know, it, we we had a lot of dark days um, during the president's term. It, 
remember it was uh, it was bookended at the start by 9/11, and it ended with uh, with the biggest financial crisis in the country's history since the Great Depression. And there was humor all the way through, not uh, you know, not in any way making light of the grave responsibilities that everybody had to execute, but uh, as a way of of keeping things in perspective and keeping things light. And uh, President Bush was the the best at it I I have ever seen or ever will see. Josh, testing the limits of your memory, uh, can you recall? Uh how he used humor yeah president president bush used it really really surgically and really tactically i mean a lot a lot of times he was he's he's a fun guy and a lot of times he'd just be joking but a lot of times he was using it very effectively to diffuse tension either with an adversary it might be a a, you know a, a senator from the other party who uh, who was antagonistic in some way. Um, it might be somebody who was nervous uh, being in the Oval Office and he wanted to put him at ease. And so humor was always a good way to do that. And one of the ways I particularly remember the president using humor is to uh, relieve tension on his staff. Now, we always pretended like he didn't notice what was going on on the staff, but he really he really did pay attention to it. And he knew it was important to the good functioning of our operation. And so when he sensed that there was tension building between two of his main staffers, uh, he would bring it out in the open in a funny way and try to try to pierce the bubble. And so that got everybody got everybody laughing about a very serious subject because he wanted the serious subject to be discussed openly with candor and still with the warmth and bond of friendship that you need to really make a team run well. And you were probably more than once uh, that nervous staffer. And one of those times was when you brought Bono to the White House. Can you talk about the moments right before they walked into the Rose Garden together? Yeah, well, uh, it took a long time to persuade the president to uh, to agree to visit with Bono um, because he was he was skeptical that celebrities weren't necessarily using the White House to promote a cause, but they were using a cause to promote their celebrity. Condi and I persuaded President Bush that uh, that was not true of Bono; that he was the real deal, genuine humanitarian with some very good points to make and could be a great ally in uh, in fighting the uh, the AIDS pandemic and uh, so he reluctantly uh, agreed to visit with him and I went into the oval office before Bono came in to brief the president on you know as we often did tell him you know here's who's coming in here's what they want here's what we recommend you say and so on. And as I was walking out, it it uh, some, there was a twinge, and it occurred to me that uh, President Bush might not know who Bono was or is. And so, uh, before I left the room to go out and get Bono, I said, "Now you do know who Bono is," and. He said, yeah, 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 rock star, you know, big, big musician. Yeah, I got it. And as I was putting my hand on the door, he said, used to be married to Cher. <laughs> and I turned around and he kept a completely poker face. And uh, to this day, I could not tell whether he was joking or not. <laughs> you know, I think of... President Bush, as the master of self-deprecating humor, he's always so happy to make fun of himself first. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, he's the best at it, and he he did it every day. And it was a great way of uh, making people feel comfortable around him. And uh, and that's both adversaries and people who were just a little too impressed with being in the Oval Office. He would he would put them at ease. Uh, and really, really disarm him. I remember that uh, he, President Bush, uh, was is is an avid reader, especially of history. And uh, many times we he would read a few history books, 
uh, on a particular subject. And then we would invite the authors of those books, you know, the great, great scholars to come to the Oval Office for a 90 minute visit with the, with the president and uh, to talk about, uh, talk about their books. And he would begin the meeting by saying, now, the uh, first thing I want to tell you is that I've read all of your books. And most of you probably think I, I can't even read, <laughs> but, but I've read them. And, uh, and that would always lighten up the room. Uh, there'd be a good laugh. And then they were at ease to have a real conversation with the president about their work. And you uh, helped add to the humor, too. Um, can you tell us about the fly problem in the Oval Office? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, one of the seriously annoying things about the White House, it's probably still true, is that for some reason in the spring, the Oval Office just gets flies and we could never figure out where they came from. Uh, I talked with some predecessors and found out that they had the problem in the spring, too. It was very annoying to President Bush, who would uh, always uh, call in his steward, Ferdy, who was a beloved member of the of the White House staff who had his own fly swatter, and he'd, he'd buzz for Ferdy in the middle of a meeting, and, uh, and Ferdy would be, you know, jumping around trying to get the fly, sometimes... President Bush would stand, you know, take the fly swatter from him and and make his own effort. So I just I, as a staffer and as a you know a convener of some important meetings, always felt awkward sitting around while either Ferdy or some combination of Ferdy and President Bush pursued a fly with one fly swatter. So I went out and had a whole bunch of fly swatters made with the seal of the White House on them so that they'd be official. I'm sure that's a violation of some protocol or law, but I'm hoping that the statute of limitations is run. And we kept them in the desk right out of uh, the president's uh, assistant, right outside the Oval Office. So I took it as my job whenever, uh, whenever we spotted a fly in the Oval Office, which was pretty often, to, uh, to slip out of the meeting get a handful of fly swatters and bring them back and distribute them to everybody who was in the meeting. Uh, and that that lightened the mood of, of the meeting. Uh, every, me every meeting that we brought the fly swatters in, that lightened it up. Terrific. Well, Josh, you're a busy man. You're running the business round table and raising a family and a myriad of other things. So thank you for taking the time to share some memories with us. Thanks, uh, thanks for this light moment, and, and thanks to President Bush and, and all of my colleagues in that administration for, uh, for keeping it light. It was, it, 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 to this day, it means a lot to me. Our thanks again to Josh, one of the greats. Uh, to hear a little bit about humor in the Clinton White House, yesterday we called on Josh King. Josh was director of production for events in President Clinton's White House. Uh, he's also the author of a fantastic book called Off Script, which I think should be required reading for anybody interested in politics or communications. And he's also got a very interesting Twitter handle, which is at polyoptics. Uh, he's currently the chief communications officer at the Intercontinental Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. We spoke to him yesterday, and here's that video. Josh King, thanks for taking the time to join us. How are you? Freddie, great to be with you. Great to be with all your guests. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this will be fun. We, uh, we're closing out the year with some lighthearted stories about humor and the presidency, and you're uniquely positioned to tell us about uh, President Clinton, and we want to know uh, how President Clinton used humor to get things done and build a culture and, and be president. Well, Freddie, you know, it's well known that Bill Clinton was born and bred in Arkansas, spent his life talking to people, hearing their stories, becoming a storyteller himself. And, you know, I'm, I'm born and bred in the Northeast. I don't have the gift for Gab that he does. Uh, but attending so many of his events, you'd hear so many of these Arkansas sayings or aphorisms that sort of lightened the mood a little bit and, and sort of set the table for a much more serious talk to come. So many of those times he'd say, you know, if you look at a turtle on a fence post, it didn't get there by accident. 
<laughs> and it doesn't sound funny coming out of my mouth, but put an Arkansas accent on that and then lead into a 30 minute dissertation. But it was always designed, Freddie, to bring a smile to people's face, make them relax. They were probably in the East Room or they'd come through security. They were nervous. They thought they were going to get a serious address. And eventually they did. But you have to get people sort of relaxed and ready to hear it and understand that the guy or person behind the podium speaking for the mic, you know, is is just like you. I've heard President Bush say that he and President Clinton get along well because they're they're both baby boomers and they were both Southern governors and they're both BS artists. <laughs> I think that's true. First, we've got a lot of that BS at all times of the day. Yeah. Uh, well, you were nice enough to dig up some photos. This first one, it looks like I see five Presidents Clinton. This is obviously pre-pandemic, so what are these masks? As you probably know, uh, a lot of what happens at the White House does not happen as a, as a staged press event. It's, it's what happens to a president, their staffs, their family, the people who are working on the 18 acres of the White House, and their comings and goings, their major events, their marriages. In this case, I think of the picture that you're showing, one of the president's first detail leaders of the Presidential Protection Division, Dave Carpenter. It's time for him to move on and do something else. You, it is a tough job, as you know. And uh, we wanted to make maybe the last event that Dave uh, had to staff his toughest. So we didn't just have one president to guard, we had five. <laughs> and in the picture, I think you see me on the far right-hand corner, but four of my colleagues, we went to the local mask store. We got four Clinton masks and the first Clinton walked into one corner of the Indian tree room of the old executive office building and said, hey, Dave, I'm over here. And then the next one said, no, Dave, I'm over here. And then we did this four, four times until finally the real uh, 42nd president of the United States walked into the main rooms. Dave, it's OK. It's just me. I'm here and, and we're here to, to send you off. Uh, this next photo, I see the president, first lady and the president is holding something that says, happy birthday, Mr. President, and you're at the microphone. Hopefully you're not doing the Marilyn Monroe rendition. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe did it at Madison Square Garden. I did it on the South Lawn of the White House, three or 400 White House staffers in front of the stage. Uh, you see those ladies at the microphone behind me and the first family. Uh, they are my backup singers. I've got a gag song sung to Jimmy Buffett's Changes in Attitudes, Changes in Latitudes. And anyone who knows me know that I can't get through half a verse before my voice cracks. I can't carry a tune. And so finally I said, I give up, Mr. Mr. President. I can't do this. Let's bring the real Jimmy Buffett out to sing with the Coral <laughs> Reefer Singers. So this became one of our impromptu, probably five song set concerts uh, before the president and first lady departed and gave everyone else a break for two weeks. Uh, the last photo, this appears to be you c coaching President Clinton, like on how to make a free throw, maybe. The Arkansas Razorbacks miraculously make it to the final four of the NCAA men's basketball championship. And this is one of those great days for any young man in his 20s who's working in the White House. Our schedule of the day calls for uh, starting in Washington, flying in Air Force One to Cleveland, Ohio, to the then Jacobs Field for the first opening day of the then Cleveland Indians uh, at that stadium. So throwing out the first pitch of a brand spanking new ballpark and then flying all the way to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina for, to watch the, the Arkansas Razorbacks play in the Final Four and then ultimately uh, back to Washington. So what kind of day is that for anyone? What CBS, which was televising uh, the Final Four that day, asked us to do was just, just bring them outside. So I, I, we took them out to the North Portico, handed them this basketball, and I said, you know, just, the, just like you did with Secretary Brown in L.A., see if you can uh, th throw off a jump shot to, in your best possible form, and CBS will take it from there. We had to do about three or four takes. I was about 15 or 18 feet away, just catching the ball, bringing it back to him, doing it again, just to get the form, get it from a couple different angles. By the time we get to Charlotte, it's 8 p.m., 7.58 or whenever the CBS broadcast is about to start. And there is this vignette, I think, to a Bruce Springsteen soundtrack. Uh, and you can find it somewhere, but it shows Clinton arcing the ball up into the Washington sky, around to major landmarks around the United States, and finally over to Charlotte, 
through the hoop, nothing but net, uh, to open the CBS broadcast. The funniest thing that I think President Clinton ever did with video uh, came in the final days of his administration. And in April of 2000, uh, you had the First Lady, who was running for Senate from New York. You have the President's daughter, who is now off at Stanford University. Uh, and you have a President basically home alone, knowing that uh, his eight years in office are coming to an end, doing all sorts of things around the White House that you do when you were home alone. And that would be like sitting, watching the laundry go around the washing machine, taking a bicycle out and going down for a, a bike ride down the, uh, the halls of the old executive office building, uh, you know, playing cards with the staff, um, you know, actually working with an intern to learn how to Xerox his face. And, and it was expertly uh, edited up, put, it, put to a great soundtrack, and, uh, and brought the house down to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. That's great. Well, if we have time, let's watch it. I wish I could be here more, but I really think Bill, Bill has so everything well. under control. Wait, 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 wait! You forgot your lunch! Well, I think his legacy is going to be the natural I environment, improving why. the green spaces of our country. But you've got to be true I've to urged him goal. to spend more time on that. The president's schedule is just as busy as ever. He's just doing different things. And one more for the road. Well, Josh, that's tremendous. Thank you so much for taking the time to share these great stories with us and shed a little light on humor in the Clinton White House. Uh, we appreciate you a lot, and we wish you all the best. Freddie, it's a pleasure. Good luck to you. Talk to you soon. Very funny video. Thanks again to Josh King. Well, we've saved the best for last. Uh, we're joined tonight live uh, by Eric Draper. Eric was the chief White House photographer for President Bush for all eight years both terms of the presidency. Uh, so he captured a lot. He saw a lot up close. Uh, he's the author of an aptly named book, Front Row Seat. And so tonight we've asked Jer uh, Eric Draper to join us from his home in New Mexico. And there he is. Hello, Eric. How are you, pal? Hey, Freddie. How you doing? Good to see you. You too. Thanks for waiting. I know you've been on this whole time. Warm warming up with great stories. Great watching sure. all this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I know you've seen a lot, and as I thought about it, it occurred to me that you've probably been in more motorcades than anyone except the president. And so why don't you take us back to your first <laughs> presidential motorcade on January 20th, 2001? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, my first official day as the White House photographer, and um, I was learning the ropes, learning how to stay in the bubble learning how to, uh, to walk with the entourage. And there's a moment after the swearing-in ceremony at the Capitol where the outgoing president says goodbye to the incoming president. And at the time, uh, typically, the, uh, the outgoing president hops on a helicopter and flies away. But the weather, it was a bad weather call, and it was rainy and, and, and cold. And so the Clintons had a motorcade sitting there. And for some reason, I ended up walking back to the Clinton motorcade. But it gets worse. I actually go inside of a minivan, and I'm sitting there, and I'm realizing that something feels really wrong. And, um, and all of a sudden, there's a voice in the back of the minivan, and it was a White House photographer. I'll never forget this. His name was Ralph Allswang. And all I heard was, uh, Eric, your guy is staying. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Literally, I'm so glad that door didn't close. So I, I bolted out of the out of the minivan and I caught up with the president and the first lady like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Your first day on the job and you almost almost flew to Arkansas or New York. <laughs> would, That's great. It would have been my last day on the job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, respectfully, you were like the ultimate fly on the wall, um, but you also got to interact with a lot of the people you you chronicled and documented. And I understand that one of those people was the Queen of England. Yes, it was a very awkward moment, I, can, uh, I have to admit. Um, 
So the Queen was visiting uh, the White House uh, with Prince Philip, uh, and there was a you know great ceremony on the South Lawn, and the President and the First Lady wanted to take the Queen on a tour of the White House. Uh, so they took her up to the residence, and I heard Mrs. Bush say, uh, let me show you the Queen's room. And I thought to myself, oh, what a great photo, because the room was actually named after her. And so I'm on the heels of the Queen, and Mrs. Bush is leading her across into the residence, and I realize that she's taking the queen into the restroom. So when I realized where I was, I, I'm say, I said to myself, I've got to get out of here. So I do an about face, and standing in front of me is Prince Philip <laughs> with a straight face. And he says, uh, Eric, are you following them to the loo? And luckily, uh, we both burst out in laughter, and I got out of there without starting an international incident. <laughs> Did you get to hear it? The royal flush? I did not. I, I got, out of there, got out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> um, hey, I, we mentioned all the photographs you captured. Of, I wonder how many you took. A million? Hundreds of thousands? I took more than, more than a million images during the eight years. Amazing. Both film and digital. I'm yeah, sure it's best lot. that we don't show them all, but I think we've picked out maybe 10 or 15 that we thought it'd be fun to just click through. And if you have any commentary you want to add, okay. great. But if not, I, my, my guess is a lot of these <laughs> great photos speak for themselves. Yeah, this Where was uh, this? the president visiting the bowling. This is the bowling alley uh, <laughs> underneath the uh, old executive office building. And the president had some downtime, and he wanted to try out, uh, <laughs> try out the bowling. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. That's a musical instrument? It was, uh, the president would receive all kinds of gifts, both uh, from you know, foreign leaders, from, from friends and family, and every time something would arrive in the Oval Office, he would always have to try it out. <laughs> so this was uh, some strange sort of, sort of instrument that uh, he, had, he, had to, he just had to try it out. He was always very playful and curious and would take any opportunity to goof off, right? Yeah, you know, he <laughs> didn't take himself too seriously, but he took the job very seriously. And, um, you know, I don't remember what was going on in this moment, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, all I remember is just catching him jumping in the air, clicking his heels. <laughs> this was the moment that the motorcade, uh, his limousine actually broke down in Rome, in the streets of Rome. And he actually had to get inside a spare limousine. And so when we arrived at the event, the president stopped at the car and was teasing the Secret Service and looking into the, into the engine. <laughs> Did he fix it? No, but I think by looking at it, it got fixed pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, anytime there is a baby involved, there's always a great moment. Politicians and babies, but he has Especially a particularly during... malleable face. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he loved to interact with people. And that, that's what I enjoyed uh, all eight years was, was his, his, his way of interacting with people. Who is massaging? That was uh, actually, that is Mrs. Bush. <laughs> who was trying to get the president to smile the way she wanted him to smile. <laughs> and this was uh, actually the, uh, taken during the, his official portrait, which is act actually a, a very important picture, the most, uh, most printed picture ever that a president has. And what is he like during photo shoots? Uh, you know, he's, he's not a very serious person. He wants to get them out of the way, to be yeah. honest. He, his, his patience runs very thin, and, uh, and typically I'll hear him say, okay, Eric, uh, we don't need a Pulitzer Prize winning photo here. Just, just get it done. <laughs> Great. And this was uh, at the Black Tie and, and Boots Ball during the second inauguration. And, of course, he's being a, a goofball. Yep. <laughs> Is this more bowling? Uh, no, this is actually an uh, inauguration, uh, pre-inauguration, uh, right before the swearing-in ceremony, uh, the, day, the night before the swearing-in ceremony. He's, he's very playful, he was very playful at the time, and, and he was very happy and, and really enjoyed his time with his, all his family being there. <laughs> he's a very playful person. <laughs> and again... <laughs> So, Another moment here where you had to interact with a, a, a gift. 
That's the first inaugural photo, right? I mean, the uh, rug. yes, that was the very first portrait. Yeah, yeah, that that, that image on the rug is uh, the first portrait I did of the president uh, right around the, his first inauguration. <laughs> Beautiful. And again, uh, the president was very playful. He, he would do silly things to break the ice. To uh, and, and his timing was impeccable. He, sure. He really had a, a, a God-given talent at, at at breaking the ice and, and putting people at ease. Fantastic. And I think this is our last photo. Oh yeah. Fitting another the gift. Uh, I believe this was. Uh, yeah, he loves bicycles, and this is around the time that he was uh, starting to be an avid mountain biker. And so all of the, the foreign leaders that would visit would give him a bicycle, <laughs> including this fold-up bike from the, uh, the president of Singapore, I believe, this bike was from. And he had to try it out, of course. He actually rode it through the West Wing into the, the chief of staff's office. <laughs> Perfect. I wouldn't recommend taking that one on the trails, though. <laughs> a little tiny. Well, Eric, I know you captured a lot of these moments and, and more in your book, Front Row Seat. Uh, but President Bush asked me to send his best to you and Carly, and thank you for doing this, and we wish you a very Merry Great, Christmas. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Merry Christmas. Eric. Thank you very much for having me. Yep. Well, I want to thank Eric and all of our participants who joined us tonight uh, on video and live, and, and, and thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, I also want to thank again Highland Capital Management, who sponsors this Engage program. And tonight, the last event of our season, I want to call out all the staff who work so hard to pull these events together, who've also uh, uh, adapted in big ways to uh, pandemic-style events like this. Um, so in particular, let's uh, thank Kevin Sullivan and Annie Walker and Scott Robertson and J.R. Williams and Eden Harkins and the entire team at the Bush Center. Thanks for the great job you do to, to pull these off. Uh, please look for updates in the new year about our uh, 2021 Engage lineup. Uh, a big theme you'll see there are events uh, about President Bush's new book and exhibit called Out of Many One. These are 43 paintings and stories of immigrants who've come to America and made our country better. And so you can come here starting in March and view those paintings. You can also buy that book starting now to be delivered March 2nd called Out of Many One. And yes, in 2022, uh, the, the exhibit Liberty and Laughter will be dusted off, resurrected, and you can actually come see this in person in 2022. In the meantime, uh, we wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thanks for your support of the Bush Center, and here's to 2021. Freddie, whatever. Hey. How much time do you all have, by the way? Are, are we good? Can we keep I'm going? Fine. Yeah. Um, He's got like two moves. There's this, and then one where he kind of pushes his yeah. tush out. Yeah. He didn't think it was all that funny, but um, the court jester. Let's try that again. <laughs> Have you ever seen him deploy that one? That's a terrible question. Let me stop. <laughs> Let me poke fun at myself first. That bad. Or maybe just me. I don't know. <laughs> I felt like that happened to me quite a few times. Ended up having a, a terrific conversation. I, I just told the wrong story. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how you were going to transition. This is when I was much younger. And you were a child, yeah. I think I was just starting to shave, so it was a while yeah. back. It, I was recently in um, Vietnam, and they had full hazmat suits on. Oh so it, it's very different. I'm using it as a cup holder, a makeshift. <laughs> and so the president relied on humor, not, not just as a way to... Uh, get things done, but to, well, I guess, no, let me start over. Thanks. All right, Merry Christmas. Merry Thanks, Christmas. Charity. Thanks. Anything else? No, I thought that was good.